All right. Uh, welcome everyone to my talk uh, entitled Design is how it works, engineering for designers. So uh, yes, it's a Steve Jobs quote. Um, the full quote is actually, design is not just what it looks and feels like, uh, design is how it works. And it's a very, very popular quote. You have tons of examples of it that you can find on Google Images. Uh, people just love this quote and uh, they love it a lot. Uh, but it's for good reasons, actually, because uh, it's a good quote. Uh, it highlights something very important in design, which is uh, designers love to think about the intention of their design, the big picture, the concept, how uh, their system work, but they don't necessarily uh, take a lot of interest in um, the machinery that is holding everything together and, and exactly how things work. So what's important to, to highlight here is that no concept or intention was never enough to create a good design. It's not just because you have a good idea that you're going to create a good design. I think that uh, designers know that very well. Um, and a quick disclaimer, in this talk, I'm going to be taking examples from uh, mainly two games. I did not work on uh, either of those games, but they're just very good games in my opinion. So they're good examples of uh, uh, the approaches that uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, hi, um, my name is William Besnard. Um, I am a creative director at Valmonarch. And uh, at Valmonac, we do games that are very much system oriented. So, so it makes a lot of sense uh, to talk about the, those engineering techniques uh, for me for that reason. Um, I have more than eight years of experience as a game designer, but I come from the engineering world. And what that means is that I used to be an engineer and I also have a master degree in engineering. And I like to blend those two approaches, the design approach and the engineering approach. I think they fit very well together. Uh, I also create Unity plugins. Uh, those are productivity plugins uh, that are available on the Asset Store, if you're interested. And I am going to soon release a new one called Rabbit. It should be available in a few weeks. So what will we talk about in this talk? Uh, we will talk about methodology. And uh, what I mean by that is to try and center our, our attention back on how our design works and, and how to analyze them. Uh, and it's also about how to know um, uh, to know how to repair broken designs. What happens when your design doesn't work anymore? And uh, also to understand what what are the consequences of what we design? What uh, what exactly will happen if we add certain features to our game? And it's also to uh, ensure that our team works efficiently. And uh, we're also going to have a part in which we're going to talk about biases and in general what leads us to make bad decisions in design. So what issues are we trying to solve here? Uh, we're trying to solve the issue that I would call the design spirals of death. And what I mean by this is um, a design idea is that you, you pile on the top of them uh, just because you're trying to fix issues uh, after issues and, and you're not really much in control of what you're doing. And uh, I'm going to give you an example of uh, a silly example, but that highlights very much what sometimes happens in, in game design. So let's take this car here. Um, and let's say that you notice that this car is not moving. No matter how much you try to make it move, it doesn't move. Well, a silly way of, of trying to deal with this would, would be to say, well, I'm, I'm just going to try to add stuff to it. So I'm going to try to add a third pair of wheel, for example. Uh, and then if it still doesn't work, I'm going to add another engine to my car. And if it still doesn't work, I'm going to add another engine to my car. And maybe it starts to move a little bit. Uh, but then ultimately, OK, why not just put a horse in front? And OK, it starts to move a little bit more. And then a second horse. And oh, yeah, now it starts to move OK. And the, the car is functional. Well, sure, it's functional. But do you actually know why uh, you had to do all this thing to make it move? And it sounds silly like this, but actually, the way we design games is not too far from this sometimes. And so in game design, uh, it means that sometimes we end up with a massive mess uh, because of this. Uh, that's World of Warcraft. Uh, of course, brilliantly designed game, but as you can see, the UI can have some some issues sometimes. Uh, so in game design, yeah, you have feature creep, you have low, low cohesion in your in your design that can cause issues. Uh, and what you, you what you may say out of this is, well, who cares if it works? If my game is successful or if my design is successful, uh, player engage, who cares, right? Well, in a way, yes, but it's costly to work this way. It's costly and it's also risky. And um, it makes your game exponentially harder to maintain. The more you add to it to try and fix an issue, uh, the harder it is to know exactly where a problem comes from. And it's also le likely less accessible because, uh, because you have so many features in your game, um, people don't really know where to look at. 
Uh, and I would argue that it's also more likely much less successful than it could be because it's less accessible. And one last point, which is less important from a product perspective, but it is important from a design perspective. It's, it's also less neat and elegant. It is a bit more messy. So how to not do this in three steps? The first is uh, we need to understand our limits here. What, uh, what, is, what are our limits as designers and as people? Uh, and uh, the most important point here is to understand that we are filled with cognitive biases. And what are cognitive biases? Well, according to Wikipedia, and it is a very complex definition, but I can simplify it later, cognitive biases are systemic patterns of deviation from norm and or rationality in judgment. And what that means is you start to make an argumentation uh, about something, but this argument actually doesn't hold much. Uh, it, 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 it just may sound good, but it doesn't hold much. Uh, and what's important to understand here is that everyone has cognitive bias. Everyone is cognitive bias. Oh, there is a typo here. Um, and you and I also regularly have cognitive biases. Uh, and it also happens to actually very clever people too. Um, there are tons of examples in history of uh, cognitive biases that caused quite some issues. Um, and there are a bunch of biases that are fairly common in game designers. I'm going to talk about three of them here because there are tons of uh, poss possible biases that, that exist. So I'm just going to focus on three of them. Uh, the survivorship bias, the false cause bias, and the slippery slope bias. Uh, if you want to know more about cognitive biases in general, there are tons of sources. Uh, one very nicely designed website is eurobias.is, and it describes in a funny way uh, what is your cognitive bias. So let's start with a few famous examples in history. Uh, this one is probably the most famous example of a cognitive bias. Um, you probably already know it. Uh, and it's about Abraham Wald and the World War II bombers. So Abraham Wald was a uh, mathematician and a statistician who used to work on engineering in uh, planes of the Second World War. And uh, at that time, the, the military um, commandment was recommending that uh, the planes would be reinforced where they were the most hit. Uh, uh, when they were returning to the base, which may make sense like that. You say, well, it, it got hit, so let's reinforce it here. But actually, uh, it is not what happens. If the plane could come back to the base, it means that it survived, uh, which means that the place where it got hit are places that are less important for the plane. And if the plane was hit in different uh, locations, which are the ones that are not highlighted in red here, chances are that it actually didn't make it back to the base and it actually got destroyed. So uh, he was uh, he got famous for introducing um, uh, the, like biases in his statistical analysis to understand that the fact that you have a sample that comes back to you doesn't mean that this sample actually represents what you should be focusing on. And so that's an example of survivorship bias in which you focus on what success uh, in order to draw your conclusion. But that's not always the right way to do it. Uh, in game design, this has two main areas in which we are very, very much uh, concerned by this. Uh, there is the other successful game idea. And what I mean by this is you have this other game um, uh, that you consider successful. And it has this feature, and it's fun. And so you consider that, yes, why not add it? Because this other game did it. So it means it works, right? Well, that's survivorship bias here. It doesn't mean that uh, it was successful because of this. Uh, it might also be that this other game um, has a certain balance, and so you, you can just copy it. Well, yes, but you need to also understand the context in which it, it used this, this balance. Uh, this other game may also have uh, a feature that we already have in our game, which means that there is nothing wrong with this feature. Well, not exactly. You have to consider the entire system to know that. And the second very common thing that game designers say is to focus on playtesters and playtester data in general. Um, the problem with this is that uh, you, 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 it's a qualitative thing. If play, if playtesters say that nothing is wrong with a feature, it does not mean that it works, although it's very tempting to actually conclude this. Uh, but the, the reverse is also true. If the playtester says they dislike the feature, it does not mean you have to change it. In fact, it might be absolutely all right, but it, it, you have to consider the big picture here. And yeah, same thing. If they actually enjoy the feature, it does not mean that it works well. Um, Another famous bias uh, in history uh, happened actually not so long ago, just to say that those kind of things happen all the time, not only in the past. Uh, a while ago, um, in the 90s, uh, a study was released uh, that highlighted the correlation between the fact that when you make uh, small kids sleep with the light on, uh, they are more likely to have myopia. And yes, 
it is more likely statistically that uh, this happens, but it does not mean, uh, like they concluded in the study, they concluded that you should not make your kids sleep with the light on. But that is not correct because this is just a correlation. Correlation, It's not a causation. Uh, and in fact, another study that was published for years after debunked this idea by just showing that uh, uh, parents with myopia were more likely to leave the light on because they have a higher trouble navigating in the room when it's dark because they have myopia. And myopia is a highly genetical factor. So the correlation is actually not a causation here. Uh, and the, the chances are that the light was left on because the parents were had myopia and not the contrary. So that's a false cause bias. It means that you're trying to identify the reason for something, but it turns out that it's not actually this. In game design, it's often that uh, you have a new feature in your game and you just added this feature and now the game works. So that was the way to fix it. Or you added this feature and now the game doesn't work. Therefore, that was not the way to fix it. Or the player won this feature and therefore we must add it because that's what the player wants. Well, not always. It's not always how it works. And you also have the respectable opinion, which is you have this highly experienced designer in your team or in your company or a consultant, and uh, this designer hates this idea, and that means we, mis we must change it, or he loves this idea, so it means this is the right way to go. Uh, that's actually not the right way to think here, because uh, uh, there is a lot of bias in this designer as well, and there's a lot of things he likes and dislikes. Um, famous uh, biases in history. Uh, there is also this one, which is very historical, uh, and it's from Master Yoda, which says, Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. anger. Anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. And I sense much fear in you, which means that Yoda is going to say to Luke that, hey, you're going to turn to the dark side. Well, Yoda should have to taken some uh, lessons from, uh, from, uh, from, from statistics and, and, uh, and science in general, because that does not meet this at all. That, that, that's actually a slippery slope. Um, and uh, slippery slopes are very common in political biases, uh, it leads to people saying, oh, if you introduce this, then it will lead to this, which will lead to that, which will lead to this. Um, that's a very common bias here, the slippery slope bias. Uh, in game design, uh, it has a few uh, implications. There is the tendency for people to want to scrap everything when something doesn't work. There is the tendency to say that if something doesn't work, I just need content in my game, and then it will work. Or that it just needs onboarding, and then when people will understand my design, then everything will work. Uh, well, all of that can be true, but it is a slippery slope. It is not a, a logical argument. Or yeah, it, it may need an extra feature, and that's also a slippery slope. Uh, so what are the risks of, um, of those uh, cognitive biases? First is wasting time and money, uh, putting your effort in something that actually doesn't hold much ground. Um, realizing too late that you're on the wrong path and that you have to actually backtrack and remove the features that you've been, you've been adding. Uh, duct taping, that you have a tendency to just fix on the fly things with minor features here and there. Or gradually making things harder to fix. Uh, the more you add, the harder it is to fix, like I mentioned before. And, but also, and that's very important, being limited by uh, loopholes and unforeseen, uh, unforeseen limits that you introduce to the system by adding those features. Uh, and what creates those biases is uh, a lot of assumption, assuming that because you have the knowledge, it means you know. Uh, I know how it works, or I've made this kind of game before, therefore I know what to do. Or assuming that it's unlikely for you to be misdirected because you have experience. I'm skilled in my field, I have a lot of experience in this. Uh, or assuming that because something worked, then uh, it will necessarily work again. Uh, which means that, I don't know, this game succeeded before, and therefore we can do the same thing. And you have a bunch of games that people usually quote in that sense. Uh, Dark Souls is one of them. Um, and another one is to assume that because you have data, it means that you have the truth. Uh, well, it doesn't mean this. Uh, play, testers, play tests are very important, but it does not mean that they will actually tell you something about your design. They will tell you about what people think of the game in the current state. That's all. Um, and that leads us to two very important points. First is, um, it usually means a lack of direction in your design, but it mostly means a lack of analysis. And this is what we're going to focus on today, uh, how to analyze your designs better. And for that, we're going to use something called system engineering. Uh, system engineering, in general, is the study of systems. Uh, it has a lot of methodologies with it. Uh, those are two examples here 
of uh, ways you, you, sh you could organize your production and uh, ways to rationalize certain designs. Um, there is, uh, it's, it's a set of industrial methodologies. It's not like one methodology to rule them all. Um, but it's here to analyze and establish designs and to fix and find problems that you may have in your designs. Uh, but the most important here is that it ensures reliability. It makes sure that things work properly. And uh, also that you save time and money and that you don't spend uh, energy doing something that's actually irrelevant. Um, it has a whole range of application. Pretty much every field of engineering has system engineering in them. Uh, but of course, what comes to mind when you think of system engineering is in general aeronautics uh, or IT or like things that are complex technology, because the more complex the technology, the more you will need a, a very robust set of analy analytic tool. Um, and it's also a set of uh, methodologies which are meant to be self-reliant, which is they are meant to understand that humans are biased, right? We have our limits. We don't always follow the right way to do things. And um, they are meant to kind of counter this. Um, we'll only talk about some of those methodologies here because otherwise it would take forever. And also I'm kind of adapting them into a more game design format. So they're not strictly the methodology you would find in the engineering world. Uh, so after we established our bias, our next step is to establish uh, directions in our design and constraints of design. And for this, we're going to use, I'm going to present you uh, three methodologies that can help you uh, better define your designs. Uh, first, we have the top down, bottom up analysis. And what is this? Uh, first, we're going to start with a top down analysis. Top down analysis is about making sure that we know what we want, that we know why we want it, and that what, and what are the priorities in this, which is what can I, uh, pretty much um, never remove from the game and what is maybe okay to remove. Uh, and most importantly here, what are the consequences of those things? Uh, which is why it's called top down, because you start from the very high level idea and you slowly go down to what are the consequences of this. So it's about uh, establishing limits. What limits my design and what should always limit my design because of what I want to do with my game. Uh, but it's very important that this remains flexible for the bottom-up analysis, and I'm going to come back to this later. Uh, usually, this part is what designers like to focus on, because it is the big picture. And uh, it's great to have the big picture, but it's not the only thing that you need. I'm going to give the example here of um, Inside, which is a game I very much like. Um, and let's try and do a top-down here. Again, I didn't work on this game, so that's my own interpretation. What we may want here is minimal interaction, no UI. Uh, we try to achieve the best game feel possible. Uh, we want to have just one button to, to make all the interactions in the game. And we want the game to be 2D, or at least uh, on a 2D plane. Uh, and then we may ask why. Well, because we want to focus on sensation, only show the essential in the game, and uh, uh, make sure that we have a visceral game feel. And a brand consistency, because before they did uh, Limbo, which is also 2D. Um, so, so then it gives us priorities. Well, the priorities here is, is to keep it as simple as possible and to try and keep the aesthetic. So it means that the design should never break that. It should always try and go in this direction. Uh, what are the consequences of this? Well, it means that we cannot have resources of any kind because that would make the game more complicated. Uh, we cannot have, uh, we have to have kinematic driven interaction. It cannot just be uh, using pure uh, physics. Uh, we cannot have an open world because that would mean a lot of uh, overlay and a lot of you know menus to to hinder the the, the experience. So on the contrary, what is the bottom up analysis? It's about how does it work, uh, and what are the tools that we have to achieve the design we want to achieve, uh, and that leads us to what are the constraints that we bring from the bottom, and how do things connect together? How do I you know connect all my design systems together? Uh, and that leads us to what can be done with all that. What uh, what designs can I possibly achieve with this? And so the better you define this, the easier it is for you to stay on scope because you know what is possible and what is not. Um, but it needs to have a top-down direction to not wander around, to to know what you where you're going. And I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna come back to this. So this part is usually what designers are less comfortable with. They are feeling a bit more uh, uneased here. Uh, so let's go back to uh, inside. How does it work? Well, you have a kinematic controller. It uses physics here and there. 
the game engine is Unity. It has inverse kinematic, for example. And so the tools is what uh, can the programmers provide to the designers? And you could say, well, there's a curve based movement. You can push and pull things. You can activate, carry, so on. And of course, they can always do meta game abilities and things like this. Uh, but that means that because we have a controller based on physics and kinematic controllers, uh, this will lead to certain restriction in the way the, the, the objects are sized, their mass, and so on. And also, the way things connect is by scene loading. So that's classic Unity. And then you can think of, well, what can be done with all this? Um, you can do narrative walking simulator. You can do 2D puzzle platformer. You can do beat them all. You can do side view tactical shooters. There is a lot that you can do here. So that's why this needs to be linked back to the top-down approach, because without a top-down approach, you could go wherever you want, and you will lack a bit of direction here. So when you merge the two approaches, you get something very cohesive, and you must always make them answer to each other. This, this needs to be a permanent dialogue in your design. And that means regularly reassessing uh, uh, those two aspects of your design uh, throughout the production of your game, so that you make sure that you're being consistent all the time. And when do you stop down and bottom up is at the start of the production, when you're designing your product, uh, before adding anything to your game, whenever you add a new feature, and always, always you should have it in mind. Uh, now, let's go to a second methodology, which is, uh, this is my term, uh, uh, brainstorm consequence tree. Uh, actually, in engineering, it's just called the consequence tree. But we use brainstorm a lot in design. And it has issues. Brainstorm is great for getting inspired. It's great for getting all the team on board to pro propose ideas and be you know, like excited about the project. And it's great for thinking outside the box and bringing something new. But it's terrible for analysis. You don't have a, a hive mind is terrible for analysis in general. It's also terrible for understanding implication of a design because you don't have time in the brainstorm. And it's terrible for establishing direction because that's the very nature of a brainstorm. You just go everywhere. So it should only used, be used at the start of a design phase when you're trying to gather um, ideas to form your design, but not after. So what to do when, you, when you're done with your brainstorm? Well, you can create a consequence tree out of this. And this is in order to find dead ends in your design and to validate it in general. And to also establish what is the, the trade-off that you're going to bring with your design, because every design always brings trade-offs. Um, and for this, the main tool I use, uh, there are tons of them, but the main tool I use myself is called MindMap. And it's a mind mapping tool uh, that is, has the advantage of very, being very quick to use. Um, and you, you'll see that this tool, I'm going to use it in pretty much all the techniques that I'm going to present in this talk. So here you have an example of tree on the side, uh, in which you see that um, uh, you may have, after a, a brainstorm, a set of feature ideas. And out of this, what you, what you want to do is try and find the consequences of this idea. What does that bring to the game? What are the limits that this is going to bring? And then what you want to do is highlight what are red flags? What are big problems that are uh, no-goes because of your design direction or your type of game or something like this? Uh, but you may also have yellow flags, which things that indicate a problem that is might be to, to be solved later, but at least it's not going to you know, be not possible. And you may as well have green flags, which is, oh yeah, this option is great because it also brings this and that to the, to the design. So let's uh, text the example of uh, Oxygen Not Included here, which is another game I really like. Uh, let's say you want to add a feature to the game, which is you want to make the way duplicants attack in the game uh, be uh, more of a challenge. You may have an idea to, uh, for example, add the boss fight, but this may have consequences in the gameplay, which is uh, you need to put bosses in the map now, uh, which means they will take room, which means that you most likely will need to make the map bigger. But also it means, and that's more important, that duplicants uh, in the game are going to be more exposed to death because they may fight. But death is built in a way in the game that it is a very punishing gameplay feature. And so it, it occurs very rarely in the game, um, which means that you will have to, if you want to bring this idea to the game, uh, kind of go over it. And you may find two solutions to this, which is, I don't know, a KO system. And I'm not going to go further in this uh, analysis here. Uh, but you may also find solutions that just simply don't work and for a various set of reasons. And so this is very important to establish what ideas that you got out of your brainstorm will potentially work or what, uh, what features are absolutely never going to work, even though it sounds like a good idea. So the next step is the why because analysis, uh, sometimes also called uh, five whys. So this is about 
uh, normally it's used uh, when you want to analyze uh, accidents in, in engineering, when something got wrong, something went wrong, sorry. Uh, in design, we want to make, we, we can use it to, to make sure that um, we answer the right question when we want to bring the, good, the, the, the new feature. Um, so it's about answering, why are we doing this again? Why do we want to add this new feature? And uh, so here we, we, we can just like uh, uh, go down the reasons and see, like constantly ask why. Why is this reason a good reason? And answer by another reason. And why is this reason a good reason? Uh, and answer again. And that's why it's called a five why in general, because you, you, it's an arbitrary number. But if you ask five times the why question, you're going pretty, pretty uh, low level. Uh, and then this allows you to actually validate the reason. Is it a good reason? Uh, does that mean that we need to change the design direction here? Or does that mean that we change, we need to change a bit the feature itself because the reason uh, is problematic, right? Uh, so yeah, it's to ensure that we're not misguided here. Um, when to use the why because. When introducing more complexity to the game, you want to add this feature, but it definitely is going to make your game more complex. Uh, when you want to introduce a system that's connected to the other systems you have, because it may have unforeseen circumstances, you need to understand why you're trying to do this. And when you're re redesigning a large part of the game. Step three of this direction methodologies. Um, oh, uh, sorry, you know, the, that's not the direction methodology. Not, we're back to the next step, which is what do you do when your uh, design doesn't work uh, or when you have a problem in your design? Uh, well, uh, you need to break down your design and you need to analyze it. And so I'm going to present two techniques here. Uh, there, there are a lot of them, but these are the techniques that I find the most useful for game design. The first one is called divide and conquer. And the second one is a general process flow and architecture analysis. So let's go over design, divide and conquer. Um, what is divide and conquer? Well, in general, um, when you consider any problem you may, you may have, the larger it is, the, the harder it is to actually solve it uh, because you have a lot of um, uh, implication in your problem. So big complex problems are in general hard to solve. Uh, and the, the second problem with big problems is that they are generally very stressful and they generate a lot of anxiety in your team. You have this huge problem and you don't know how to solve it and you, you have a tendency to panic which leads back to the tendency for designers to want to scrap everything and start over again, which is sometimes the right way to go, but not always. Um, because most of the time, your problems can be broken down into smaller pieces. Um, and when they can be broken down, uh, the, the great thing about this is you can keep on breaking them down into smaller and smaller and smaller problems. Um, and that is much uh, more manageable. It is easier to handle in your mind, but also in your stress, because you see this problem like, well, that's not a great, that's not a very hard problem. And this one is not very hard either. And when I solve all of them, then my big problem will actually be very manageable now. Um, and another uh, aspect that's uh, pretty important here is that it allows you to divide the, the, the work. And you can allow your designers to work on different part of the problem to try and solve them on their own. And then you can have designers uh, bring back to the team, like say, hey, this problem is actually very big and I need more help on this one. Or designers saying, hey, this problem is actually very simple to solve and here's how I solved it. Um, the problem with the, the issue with small problems is you need to be organized about them. So you need to write them down. You need to have a set of tools to write them down. And for this, we're going to use again uh, this mind map um, system which is we have our big problem and we're going to decompose it into medium problems, which can be hopefully decomposed into small problems, which can be hopefully decomposed into tiny problems. You cannot always do that. Sometimes you're going to be left with a serious problem in mind. But in my experience, a lot of the time, you can actually break them down to very small pieces. So this is an example here. Um, we start with the, the fact that we uh, acknowledge that our game stops to be engaging after one hour for some reason, right? Uh, bad approaches when you have a problem like this is to say, okay, uh, panic mode, let's add more content, let's add another feature, let's add more polish because uh, it will help. And the truth is, yes, it will help. But the problem is you're actually not solving your design issue here. You're dodging it. And you're actually making it more complicated because now it's going to be harder to measure the fact that you have an engagement problem because you have features to counterbalance it. So then what you can do is just start to ask question. What causes my lack of engagement? Uh, and it might be that the player doesn't know what to do. It might be that you have too many resources and not enough to spend on. 
Uh, it might be that you don't have enough challenges, right? And then if you don't know what to do, well, you have to check for the UX clarity. Maybe the objectives are not highlighted enough in the game. Uh, maybe the objectives are not paced properly and you have this kind of downtime in which no objective occurred because the balance is wrong. And maybe you have a problem with your systemic engagement, which is your game loop does not provide enough engagement on its own. Um, and if you have too many resources and not enough to spend on, uh, uh, then you may analyze the resource flow, the way you gain resources, the way you uh, lose them, uh, and, and check the balance, check the timings, and so on. And if you have no challenge occurring, then you need to analyze your game loop. And I will come back to this later. So uh, the next step for analysis in case you have problems is to consider uh, analyzing your processes, your flows, and your architecture. That is the ones of your design. Um, the best tool for this is called CSML, and it's uh, a way. Uh, it's in, in general an open source language uh, that describes how to um, how to present uh, general functioning of whatever you're trying to present, uh, which makes it a very generic tool. It can be useful for a, a whole range of uh, of things. Uh, for us, it's going to be a way to clarify the loops in our game the way things flow and the logic of our design. And it's also very, very useful to be able to highlight design issues in your, in your game. So what I want to insist on is that you must know your game loops in the game. Uh, if you don't in your game, it means that you are potentially uh, lacking tools to analyze what you're, what's going on. And what I mean by game loops is uh, the gameplay loops, which is what actions the player take uh, in order to continue playing the game, the resources loop, which is where is a resource spent and where is it uh, gained? And the content loop, how is the content unlocked over time? Um, and so uh, it's super important here that you don't keep your design as text only. Uh, sometimes we have a tendency to keep things in our head and to describe our design in a textual way only for implementation. But we need designers, we need uh, to have a way to formalize the way uh, we, we present our design. And a way to formalize our design is to actually graph it. If you can't graph your design, then it probably means something is not working somewhere and that you need to break it down a bit more. So an example here for Oxygen Not Included is, of course, that you have your, I mean, if you play the game, if you don't, I encourage you to play the game because it's a really good game. Uh, you start by digging. And when you dig some things, you get resources out of it. Uh, and you find them. And then you can exploit the res those resources. And that allows you to unlock new content, which will prompt you to dig for new kinds of resources. And there you have it. The loop is, is closed. And it's a very neat loop because it's a very simple one. Uh, so let's take an example of a loop analysis here. Um, you, have, uh, a, a, you have a lot of big games like uh, City Builders, such as Anno. Uh, those games, they contain a lot of loops inside them. So I'm just going to describe a very simplified flow of the way citizens work in the game here, which is you reach a new milestone in the game you gain citizens. Uh, it, it provides conditions to the next milestone thanks to this, uh, which means that the new category of building is shown as a reward, and you know what you can build now. Uh, the player can check how to build the buildings, sees that he misses uh, or they misses, they miss a certain resource, and then uh, they're going to try to find the resource on the map. Um, so, And once you identify the resources, you can uh, start to build the buildings you need, you need for the next milestone. And once you're done with this, you're going to have like a lot of visual rewards, new content reward. Uh, the building changed their look. The, and then you can be on, again, the same loop again, which is you're going to try to reach the next step of the citizen uh, milestone. So that's also a very neat game loop because it's simple. The player knows what to do next and uh, knows uh, uh, how to, like, it, it makes the player want to continue to play the game. But let, let's break the game a little bit here and pretend that it doesn't work this way. Um, this is why such a flow analysis is super useful. Because let's say you have a new citizen milestone, but the player actually has to search for the building because the designer wanted uh, the player to, to have this kind of hide and seek thing. Uh, well, uh, after analysis, you may conclude that it requires a lot of guesswork and it lowers the attention of the player. So it's not working. Uh, and then let's say that. Uh, instead of having new citizens coming to your to your city, uh, the designers decided that the citizen should be uh, transferred to the new tier. Well, the problem is that you're going to lose citizens, which is going to break your industries in the game. So 
again, formalizing uh, the, the loop of the game allows you to, to kind of pinpoint what's the exact problem here. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I put here a, a bunch of examples of how can you analyze it, which is you can highlight in red the points that are not working. You can put comments on those kind of flows. Uh, you can um, identify the way the resource is spent or the way the resource is added. Uh, and you can also kind of highlight problems in the balance. So for example, here, if in two parts of the, my game loop, I, I don't have citizens anymore, then it probably means that I'm going to have an imbalance in the game and it's going to be problematic over time. Um, and here, I also, in this kind of graphs, graphs here, I also make sure that um, I show in colors what is the place where you get rewarded by the game and what is the place where the game asks you for attention where where is it where it, it is challenging because that that kind of shows you um, whether you have a good balance in this too um, so what's great about this kind of analysis is first of all you get things under control you get resources under control you know every step of your game it clarifies things a lot now you know what's going on um, and it also highlights what is the reward in the game and what is the what are the challenges in the game um, so it helps you uh, concentrate on the way you want to craft your experience what are the precise mo the precise moments in the game but it also makes loopholes very easy to identify if the arrow leads nowhere or if you have a step that leads nowhere then you're like well that that's a problem it should go back to the reward for example um, and it also highlights unclear steps and and the, the places where you have a downtime in which you don't have much to do in the game um, and it's important here that you find your own way of defining the, the, your graphs because CSML has a set of um, rules about it, but for design, they can be sometimes very constraining. So I find it very useful in a project to establish at the start, like that's how we're going to present it. Uh, these are the rules of presenting our loops. And this way you have a common grammar with your designers and you know uh, how to identify certain things. Step four, uh, now that you know how to analyze stuff and, and potentially repair things, how do you repair things re responsibly? Uh, well, you have two methodologies for this. You have the fault tree analysis and you have the root cause analysis. Uh, fault tree analysis is fairly similar to the divide and conquer things I presented before, uh, the technique I presented before, but it's centered on potential mal malfunction. So it's about understanding what could potentially go wrong with your, with your design before you even actually commit it to, to, to the players. Um, and in this way, you can even put risk factor and say, well, that part is going to be more risky. So I need, to, I need to know how I could potentially fix this aspect of the design in case it doesn't work. And this helps you save a lot of money because now uh, you know how to solve it if you've encountered a problem in case it, it occurs. Uh, yeah, so it's similar to divide and conquer, except the the, the reasoning for this is different. Uh, and root cause analysis is fairly similar, but it's once you have a problem. Now, now you have a problem and it's apparent in the game. Um, and it's kind of like the why because, but here uh, you're trying to identify the number one reason for things to not work. It's not always existing. Sometimes you don't have a root cause, but it's good to know out of all the reasons I found in my why because, um, what is the, the, the cause that I absolutely need to put my attention on right now? And so this is about highlighting the tree of the potential root causes and find the, the, the one that really is problematic here. Yeah, so what, what exactly is the problem, where it comes from? And it's not necessarily about how to find it, or how to solve it, sorry. It's about finding the problem, not solving it. Yeah, so it's, not, it's useful when you're not sure where it comes from, the problem. Uh, yeah, and it also reduces the fall forward because if you know exactly what's your problem, you're less likely to uh, panic again and want to add more things to fix it. Uh, in general, adding things is only going to make things worse, except if you know exactly why you're adding it. So um, yeah, that's a typical example for engineering here in which you would have a problem, your electronic mixer doesn't work, and you try to ask several times the question why and uh, you try to identify what's the solution out of this, uh, which is like trying to find uh, the solution that uh, is as close to the user as possible, right? The one that the user can actually, um, will be actually affected by and potentially cause a lot of problems in your design. Okay, how to go further from this? Um, you have a set of uh, methodologies that I'm not going to describe here because they're very complicated. Uh, 
uh, very well described too. Uh, but it's about finding ways to organize your entire uh, team structure uh, in order for them to be um, um, organized around the idea that you have a model for your design and that you're trying to uh, make sure it's respected all the time. Um, those are not necessarily extremely useful for game development because of the very iterative nature of it, but it's, it's worth looking at it and taking a look and, and knowing what, um, uh, what kind of, uh, um, what, what kind of thing can be done in the industry in general. So conclusion, um, you may think that it sounds like a lot of work right now, uh, for not much. Uh, yes, it's a lot of work. That's true. But on the long run, and in general, the more you design things, uh, the more you're going to see the benefit out of this, uh, because you're gonna you're you're gonna be able to um, handle the problems before they occur, and when the problem occur, you're gonna have a much clearer picture on how to handle them. So you're gonna save a lot of time. And yes, it's a bit of an, a bit of an investment to do at the start, and it may sound like a, a lot of formalization for nothing. But in my experience, it is always worth it. Uh, the larger the game, the bigger the risk. So the larger your game, the more you will benefit from this. Uh, and the more complex is your game, also the larger is the, is the risk of not using such techniques. And what we should absolutely stop to say as designers is we don't know where to go. We can't know where to go. Well, yes, that's true. We cannot know where to go, but we can try to minimize the risk here. Uh, or we may say our process is unstable because that's how game dev is. That game dev is about iterating and, and finding the right way to do your game and so on. Yes, it is true. You have a lot of uh, prototyping and a lot of trying to do. But it, this technique is not about removing this. It's not about removing the fact that you want to explore what your game is. It's about minimizing the risk that you're actually taking a wrong direction here. Uh, and it's about assessing what's unknown. What is the risk of this thing that I don't know what it is about? And what is the fairly straightforward part of my design? Uh, and I want to add a few words on team building here, because uh, this methodology is very much method oriented, right? It is based on facts, it is based on analysis, um, but it is very important to consider that the human factor is crucial here. Um, you have people working on this, uh, you don't have machines, right? So it is absolutely crucial when you want to take such an approach to make sure that it is a policy of your design team or even of your whole company that making mistakes is okay. It's normal, it's acceptable that even if you're very experienced, you can make mistakes and that in general, mistakes are not being punished as a judgment of value. You did a mistake, therefore you're a bad designer. This should never happen. Uh, because when you analyze those things here, you will find that there are mistakes everywhere in design. So everyone will make mistakes and people should have this kind of attitude that they're rather willing to find their mistakes and how to improve them, which means that you need to be very kind about it. Uh, no one should feel ashamed of, of their design because of the way analyses are made. And this is very hard to achieve. And I am certainly uh, uh, also, uh, I, I certainly made mistakes in this and I still make mistakes when it comes to making sure people are not ashamed of the way you analyze their work. But it is a focus you need to always have in mind because it's important that your people are still, you know, willing to work in, uh, in the design, on the design. Designers put a lot of themselves in their design. It's their baby in, in, in a way. So you've got to treat it with respect. Um, yeah, be kind, be gentle when you make analysis. And uh, having a fact-oriented methodology does not mean that uh, you are suddenly free from having a, a, a team spirit to life. You need to make sure your designers are you know, happy to do this. And those analyses need to be collaborative. Um, uh, what, I, what I mean by this is not that everyone should be working on them at the same time. Uh, what I mean by this is rather that um, once I'm done with my analyze, I can give it to the team and we should discuss it. Um, it's important that analyzes are made on your own though, because or, or with a very small team, one or two people, uh, because those are not works of, th those are not creative work, those are engineering works. So they're more about making sure you find the right way to describe it. Um, uh, so having a form of a um, creative mind about it can be good, but it's also, it also can lead to less um, accuracy with what you're trying to do. However, when the analysis is done, are done, um, make sure that you actually talk about them 
make sure that uh, the the team can come in and say, well, I disagree with this point, or I would add this point to your analysis, and and um, yeah, making sure that um, all this is um, is you know still still focus on the on the team spirit. Uh, it's also important to use neutral elements of languages here. Um, designers have a tendency to get angry at bad design, understandably. Uh, but it's important to not say things like, this is broken, uh, this is bad design, uh, this is wrong, things like this. Uh, rather, using neutral language uh, elements, which says, like, this design is problematic, uh, there is an issue here, uh, there is a loophole, something like this, then allows us to, to kind of not take it personally. Um, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at uh, Bill Sansky, and uh, we're recruiting at Vermonarch. If you are a good game designer, if you think you have a lot of uh, experience in game design, we're more than willing to hear you. And uh, I'm working on a great project right now, and we're certainly looking for good designers. Uh, and if you want to check what I do uh, as uh, my uh, side activity of plugin developer, uh, you can check on the Asset Store Selection Parrot, which is a sele selection tool for Unity. It helps you select things in general. Or Monkey, which is a general uh, comment manager. Um, and soon I'm going to release a third one, which is called Rabbit. And that's it for my presentation. So now I guess uh, we have time for questions. And I'm going to check the ones that were sent so far. OK, one says, can you share sources, places to learn more about the mentioned methods? OK, so this one, uh, the, thankfully, you have tons of resources on the internet when it comes to system, design, uh, system engineering. Uh, it's a well-known field of engineering. So you can simply just Google system engineering, and uh, even the Wikipedia page will, will you know, take you through a vast amount of methodologies to, to use here. OK, you have. Uh, what are your book recommendations for game design? What are your top books or resources for game development in general? Uh, that's a hard one, because this kind of thing uh, that I'm describing now is not described in game design books in general, um, which, is, which is a shame. Um, well, um, I love the book Game Feel. It has nothing to do with uh, the talk I just did, but it is a great book to understand one of the field of game design, which I think is the one that's the most forgotten. Uh, that being said, if you want to learn about those methodologies here, uh, game design books are not necessarily your best source. I would say that the best way to learn them is to practice them, to try and have an analytical mind, and, and you know, like even analyze games you like. And this is going to give you a lot of experience here. All right, then I have. Won't relying heavily on such approach result in going a lot towards the most obvious and less interesting solutions because they will fit best in the tools. So uh, this, when, when, you, when you try to analyze um, games with this approach, it's important, it's super important that you keep in mind your, uh, your direction, first of all. So you're not just choosing the obvious solution. You're also choosing the one that makes sense within the game you're trying to make. And at the same time, that you you understand the drawbacks for everything, which is uh, um, the the most obvious solution also has drawbacks. Every every design solution has drawbacks. It's not about trying to hide them and say, well, that's simple, so let's take it. It's really to take it very very deep and try to understand. Okay, this is a solution, but what are all the consequences of this solution? Um, all right, then I have. Does a game designer have to have some experience in coding in order to make a prototype by himself to test his design? Or is it just a nice add-on skill in your opinion? Uh, so I would say it depends uh, on where you intend to be working as a game designer. Knowing how to code is not necessarily needed for game design. Uh, however, it is going to bring you a lot to know how to code. Uh, it's going to bring you a lot of logical thinking. It's going to bring you a lot of experience uh, from the, the sides the, of the team that you're, you're going to be less, uh, uh, less aware of. And in general, if you know how to code as a designer, uh, you're going to respect much more the, the work of your programmers on one side. And you're going to know as well what is much easier, uh, like, uh, what is uh, potentially hard to make and what is potentially easy to make. You're going to have a better insight on this. So it is a good thing to know how to code. It is not necessary uh, to become a game designer, but it is a good thing. Uh, but um, 
uh, although the, all the techniques that I presented here, uh, those can work on paper. You don't need to actually have a prototype to test your game design idea. And it's also the power of this, these methodologies is you don't actually need to wait until you have a game working to analyze your design. If you have a design on paper, you can go as deep as you want. And it's very easy to do if you formalize it. If you have all those trees and those graphs, then you just dig in one part of the graph and you, you just know more about it. Um, all right, and I have one last question, which is, how did you learn these things? Well, <laughs> uh, I studied engineering. That's how I learned this thing. Um, those are those methodologies are very, you know, uh, straightforward engineering methodologies. Um, so yeah, that's how you learn about them. Uh, and as a side note on this aspect. Um, I believe that designers would benefit a lot from being uh, for from considering themselves as engineers, for the reason that uh, even though your work is creative as a designer and you've got a lot to imagine and you've got a lot to think about and and try to to be in a sort of um, a very creative space in your mind and absolutely you need this as a designer. I would argue that a, a more useful skill for a designer is to make sure that you know what to do out of those ideas. You know how to put them together, how to create a system and how to analyze it. So, so um, designers should consider themselves as engineers much more than they are doing right now. Um, yeah, I think that's all we have for questions. So thanks a lot for attending my talk. I hope you found it useful. And uh, if you have any more questions, you can also uh, just uh, poke me on Twitter and I will just answer them. Thanks a lot.